In its report on World Trade Center 7, which came out in May of 2002, FEMA documents in Appendix C steel that has been melted and even partially evaporated, resembling Swiss cheese. What are we to make of this? My name is Jeff Fair. I have a PhD in material science and engineering from the University of Minnesota. I have a BA in physics from Brigham Young University. I've worked with uh, solid state reactions. I've worked uh, um, characterizing materials, uh, ma semiconductor materials, thin films. Uh, I currently do a lot of work with uh, nanoparticles as well as uh, solid state reactions. So Jonathan Barnett's study, uh, which I thought was very well done and, and quite extensive, is all documented by FEMA in Appendix C in their, in their BPAT report that was May of 2002. Unfortunately, it was never used in the NIST report. My name is Jason Cheshire and I'm a licensed professional engineer in the province of Ontario in Canada. And I have uh, been working in the field of hydrometallurgy for the past 10 years. Uh, for a major company here in Canada. And I'd like to know why NIST excluded the document uh, from FEMA in Appendix C that uh, documented this, the, the evidence of melting steel. Well, why is this not included? Why is this forensic evidence not being included in the report? First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of melt molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who has said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Yeah, molten bit. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like lava. Like, like, like lava. From a Actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall. And the cleanup was very difficult in the beginning. Steel was coming out red in certain areas from the first couple of weeks. This fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. And they pulled out the big block of concrete, and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. My name is Mark Basile. I'm a chemical engineer. I have a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I've worked for about 25 years in industry and the majority of what I do is analytical work uh, and figuring out what materials are composed of, why they are what they are, why they do what they do. There were sections of them that clearly showed melting. They had uh, sections that were thinned away and there were actually holes through them and some of the ends were just melted away or even possibly evaporated away. I'm Kathy McGrade. I have a bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, which I got in 1979. I then spent the next 30 years uh, with three startup companies. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. And yet we have evidence of molten iron in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, and the, the, the metal pouring out of the side of the tower. We could have filled up the Twin Towers with jet fuel and burned it all up and it, it does not cause a fire hot enough to melt structural steel. My name is Gary Warner. I'm a uh mechanical engineer. I hold a professional certification from, uh, from uh, the Association of British Columbia. I worked as a, uh, uh, in the project engineering department of the casting plant uh, of Alcan, the aluminum company of Canada, one of the largest aluminum smelters on the planet at the time. And uh, in that smelter we turned aluminum oxide into aluminum, mol molten aluminum. Molten aluminum is silver. It's not yellow, it's silver. It looks like mercury. The yellow molten metal that I saw pouring out of the South Tower uh, is indicative of molten iron. I was a bit incredulous when I learned that NIST claimed that the uh, molten metal was aluminum. It doesn't look at all like molten aluminum. Looks like iron, molten iron. That's what it looks like. And I've seen tons of it. We used to cast this uh, in Alcan. We, they still cast it. I spent two years casting that. I'm David Gregg. 
I have a master's and PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois. Afterwards, I went to work for Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, where I worked there for more than 30 years. You cannot get a flame hot enough to start the metal to molten, make it molten in the first place so that this other process takes off. I don't know of any mechanism for that. The only way that's known that a carbonaceous material can cause steel or iron oxide to, to be, turn into a molten metal is in a blast furnace. Yeah, and that's very different than what we had. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open-air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. The next question is how do you get, how do you get the sulfur um, in these uh, pieces of steel or, or in the debris? And, um, and that question is, is unanswered. There's a version of thermite called thermate, which has uh, sulfur in the, in the thermate to and what the, th what the sulfur does is it, it, uh, it's sort of like um, salt on ice. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide and it just basically makes the uh, steel melt at a lower temperature. So instead of having to bring the steel up to 1500 centigrade, you can slice through it with material that's at 900 or 1000 degrees centigrade. And if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition, you can find all sorts of wonderful devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolitions. Thermite is, in the old-fashioned thermite, is a mixture of pulverized aluminum and pulverized rust. And if you can get these, this mixture to react, which is not so easy, it produces tremendous heat and this is what you call an incendiary. An incendiary is something which can be used to destroy something by the means of heat. While an explosive is something which reacts at the pressure. It knocks things apart. Now, the old-fashioned incendiary is not an explosive. It, but it is still used for military purposes for melting iron structures. Practical applications of thermite involve uh, things such as equipment decommissioning in the military when they have a piece of artillery or a tank or something like that that they don't want to leave behind to the enemy they throw what are called grenades, thermite grenades down the barrel let's say uh, but thermite does not explode it simply reacts, produces large amounts of heat and molten material. In the case of thermite cutting charges you would have heard far less noise since they are worked by uh, thermal heating, melting of the steel, rather than an explosive cutting as in RDX charges. I'm Kim Ireland. I have a degree in chemical engineering from Clarkson University in 1963. After graduating, I served two years as a reserve officer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where among other things, I had training in uh, explosives such as C4. I was involved in the industrial chemical industry for 20 years, with uh, major companies. There were reports of uh, molten steel having been seen in the, uh, in the rubble pile of all three buildings. And uh, I knew that jet fuel, uh, which is essentially kerosene, uh, is not uh, capable of melting steel nor iron. Um, kerosene or jet fuel uh, burns uh, at less than 1600 degrees Fahrenheit and molten steel needs at least uh, 2700 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in order to uh, melt. The thing that uh, most struck me about the 9-11 incident was uh, following the incident how uh, overflights had detected uh, with infrared camera 1400 degree Fahrenheit hotspots on the surface 
uh, of ground zero. And uh, that being there for a week, um, you know, indicates that there was something very hot going on below the surface. Another question that may haunt the new Freedom Tower. According to USGS, they found as much as 6% of the World Trade Center dust consisted of tiny, previously molten iron spheres. What does this tell us about the temperatures generated in the tower's destruction? My name is Adam Parrott, and uh, I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Queen's University. I've been working for an environmental consulting firm for a number of years. When the USGS collected samples of the World Trade Center dust, uh, they found the iron microspheres. Insofar, the USGS does not have a valid explanation for the presence of these iron microspheres. But I've independently seen uh, thermitic activity within two separate independent samples of World Trade Center dust. I'm Jerry Lobdell. I'm a retired physicist and chemical engineer. I have a BS in chemical engineering from Texas Tech and I have uh, extensive coursework in mathematics and physics from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I've had broad experience in analysis and applied research, 30-year professional history spanning physics, chemical engineering, statistical analysis and modeling, and operations research. So what do the microspheres contain? Uh, iron is the main element, and then it has smaller portions of aluminum, sulfur, a trace of manganese, a trace of uh, potassium. Most of them are less than about a tenth in, of an inch in diameter, and they're spherical, and they're found in all of the dust blown out of the buildings during collapse, no matter where in Manhattan the, that dust is picked up. You must have had a much hotter heat source for you to get 2700 degrees Fahrenheit in order to melt the, the steel, melt the iron, to get these iron, these spheres, these molten spheres. Your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4500 degrees Fahrenheit. My contention based on finding thermite residue in the dust is that it happened before. It didn't happen after in the, in the fires that ensued in the rubble pile afterwards. It's the, all the characteristics of the microspheres along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found tell me that thermite was involved in melting that, uh, those steel beams.